I want to thank you, Richard, and thank you, CEI, for the chance to be here. So I do have to start with my disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views as a commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission and not necessarily the views of my fellow commissioners or the commission as a whole. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you especially for being here at the CEI Summit 2023 here in beautiful Lake Tahoe, Nevada. We know you had a choice of which public policy summit to attend, so we're glad <laughs> that you decided to be here with us. My name is Richard Morrison. I'm a senior fellow here at CEI. My work focuses on the intersection of political and economic freedom, and in the last few years in particular, I've written a lot about financial regulation, stakeholder theory, and environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, investing. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with our featured speaker here this morning, but just in case, I'll give her a brief introduction. Hester Peirce was appointed as a commissioner to the US Securities and Exchange Commission by President Trump, and was sworn in in 2018 prior to joining the SEC. Uh, which I, cons and I consider this her most impressive professional achievement. She was a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center in financial regulation at George Mason University. Uh, she, well, there, she was a contributor to and co-editor of an excellent book, which is still great reading, called Reframing Financial Regulation, Enhancing Stability and Protecting Consumers, which was published back in 2016. So I think there's a great quote from uh, March of 2022. It, uh, that you put together said, quote, current SEC disclosure mandates are intended to provide investors with an accurate picture of the company's present and prospective performance through manager's own eyes. The proposal, this is about the climate disclosure proposal, by contrast, tells corporate managers how regulators doing the bidding of an array of non-investor stakeholders expect them to run their companies. And then uh, my favorite analogy from one SEC to another, the uh, greatest Sports conference of all time, the Southeastern Conference, uh, sometimes gets mistaken for the other SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, and so you, you mentioned it is not the Southeastern Conference Commissioner's job to get into the huddle and pick what play the team should run, nor is it the Securities Exchange Commission's job to tell companies how to operate. We can see that's already a conflict, but my question is, the proponents of ESG policymaking, as uh, people you are certainly familiar with, their, their arguments and attitudes, do they not acknowledge this conflict? Or do they think it's actually a feature, not a bug? Is it their goal, their explicit goal, to have federal agencies like the SEC telling companies how to invest? I mean, it's complicated. There are a lot of people, and there are a lot of different motives. I think there are a lot of people who are, who are proponents of some sort of ESG disclosure who really think it would simplify the world. Um, because right now, if you're running a public company, you're gonna get lots of queries from lots of independent um, standard setters or, or raters or scorers who are gonna score your company on, on how well you do on ESG issues. And so from the perspective of a company, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out which one of these things surveys do I actually have to answer. If I don't answer it, I'm gonna get dinged on the survey, I'm gonna get rated lower. Um, and so wouldn't it be nice if there were just one set of questions that I had to answer and that coming from a government regulator? Um, so there are some companies that are, that are eager to have the information for that reason. They're asset managers who are asking the SEC to standardize data because they're right now doing their own work to collect data around ESG issues that they think are important. Um, and they say, well, it would be easier if the SEC mandated every company provide it so that we could have the information. You know, I push back on that a little bit because if you think that you found a particular piece of information that you can collect and that you think is really valuable, you might have an edge by not then having everyone have that same information. But um, so the idea is let's have comparable, reliable information. Um, so there's some people who want that. There are questions around whether that information will actually be reliable and accurate, but we can talk about that separately. 
And then I think there is a subset of people. So the Europeans are definitely very much embracing this concept of, no, we are actually trying to get companies to change what they do. In the US, we really have a limited mandate at the SEC, which, which Congress has said to us, we want you to address the information asymmetry problem. People at, who are running public companies have a set of information that the people who, who are investing in those companies doesn't have, and so help, help those investors get that information so that they can make decisions um, about whether they want to be invested in that company or not. So our mission is limited, and we're not supposed to do the kind of thing where we say, um, let's change behavior. But it's not only in the climate area, in, in, in our cybersecurity rules, for example, we, we recently proposed a set of cybersecurity disclosure rules for public companies. But again, the underlying theme of those rules was public companies are not spending enough money on cyber disclosure, so let's force them to, by forcing them to make all these disclosures, which will then drive their decision making and drive their resource allocation. It's usually sort of a subtle undercurrent. It's hard to sometimes put your finger on it, but I I, I noticed in, the, in our climate proposal that one of the suggestions in there was, well, if it's too hard for you to get the information that you need to make these disclosures from your suppliers, consider changing your supplier. <laughs> so we're going to have companies change who supplies them based on whether they can provide climate data. You know what that means. It means small companies are going to be less attractive as suppliers because they don't have the resources to make up the numbers. Um, and then th another suggestion in there was, well, you could consider making a different product altogether. <laughs> and so again, I, I doubt that the final rule will have that kind of, I mean, maybe it will, but I think I called that out and other people have called that kind of thing out. So people really are trying to tie everything back and say, no, 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 this is not about values. It's about value. Um, and fine, if you can show a link between something and, and financial value, that's great. Uh, you know, that is fine. But you can't just assume that everything is financially material because it, it seems like it should be important. That is a helpful suggestion. Like, uh, if you find these rules too onerous, have you considered just going out of business entirely? That might and be actually, I have had uh, at least, uh, you know, I've, I've had people come and say to me, we can't, we could not actually provide this information in a way that would be accurate. And so I would have to try to take this company private. So the idea that there should be more disclosed information, that the information should be uh, consistent and reliable, those sound like pretty positive things in general, that you would have a consistent, reliable uh, data set. Although I think it's interesting that policymakers and some people who write about this topic have uh, started introducing the phrase decision useful. They say, we want disclosure information, but we want it to be decision useful. I would, have, I would have thought that that was obvious, but apparently so much information has been required to be disclosed that was of absolutely no importance to anyone that they have to say, well, this time it's going to be actually useful for making decisions, so don't, don't worry. Um, but Richard, I think it's really important that you, you, you pointed that out because that's such a subtle shift. So we, we have traditionally talked about financial materiality as the touchstone. Then when people pushed back and said, oh, I don't think that all this information is financially material, they started to use the term decision useful which is a lower standard than financial materiality because if, if you, we, we think about the world of investors, it's a very broad world with a lot of different people who have a lot of different things that are important to them. The one thing that unites investors is they're looking for a financial return. And so, so what I say is my job is to get you information that relates to you getting a financial return on your investment. Richard, you know, I know you like to travel. I see your Twitter feed all the time. If you're interested about where a company's facilities are because you'd want to go visit them, I, I, you know, that really isn't important to your fellow investors. And so it's not material to the financial return. And so, yes, it would be decision useful to you, but it's not 
financially material. And so I think we do have to pay attention to that subtle shift in language. Mm -hmm. And so when it, when it comes to the idea of, again, having this sort of consistent data set or reliable, verifiable standards for things, again, that sounds like a good thing, but I think some of the topics we're talking about can't, are so squishy, they can't bear the weight of, uh, they, don't, they don't support a sort of formal quantitative definition. So one of the rules that's in process now is uh, about the names of investment funds, of uh, ESG, green, sustainable investment funds, and I think it's been since 2000, the SEC has had rules about the naming of funds. And so if you call yourself the European Equities Fund, you have to have 80% of your holdings in European equities and so forth. Um, so that's been around for a while, but the proposal now is to extend that to cover terms like green, sustainable, ESG, climate, green energy. Um, and when that rule was proposed, the chairman um, had a, a video that went out on the internet and he was describing in sort of, you know, very basic layman's terms, what is the rule and what it's supposed to do. And he said, well, we're trying to make sure that when you see a fun investment fund's name, you know you can trust what it says. And so he says, well, think about going to the grocery store. If you go into a grocery store and you see a carton of skim milk on the shelf, you can be sure that it's actually skim milk because there's FDA, USDA rules about, you know, you can't say skim milk if it's not skim milk. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what we're trying to do for these ESG investment funds. But terms like sustainable and green don't have quantitative definitions. They don't have hard definitions at all, right? You can send a sample of milk to a lab and they can say there is, no, there is zero milk fat in the sample. You can't send an ETF prospectus to a laboratory and have a report back that says, yes, it's, quote, sustainable. It's objectively sustainable. So, uh, and it's not just, you know, it's not just this rule. There's some attitude is in sort of the rest of this ESG rulemaking in general. How are we supposed to have hard definitions and comparable data for terms there's no common agreement on in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a difficult uh, issue, and it's it's not actually only this this rule that Richard referred to is not it's not only about ESG sustainable green funds. It's actually applies more broadly to names in a way that you know would, would apply, for example, if you put growth in the name of your mutual fund. Um, and so it's more around strategy where you get a lot of different approaches to a strategy. And so I think a lot of people are wondering how is this gonna work even outside of the green sustainable area. We have shied away from defining ESG, from de defining sustainable or defining green. And, and for reasons that I mentioned with when I was discussing the European taxonomies, I think I'm happy that we're not going down the road of trying to de define from a central government standpoint, what something, what it means to be sustainable or green. But the difficulties of trying to write rules without doing that are also quite, uh, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to do that. So we are in a place where um, it will be difficult. Now, I think there, with respect to public company disclosures, there's a lot of discussion about accurate, comparable, reliable, and the, the view is if you get the accurate, comparable, reliable information about greenhouse gas emissions and about um, what you're doing for transition risk, if you can get as much, you know, as many data points that then can be compared across companies, maybe it'll make the job of these funds easier. Um, but I think what you're ending up seeing and what I expect we'll see more of is you'll see people knowing that they can't really estimate these numbers with precision, but they'll all rely on, the, on, on an agreed upon consultant's approach. And so they'll all make the numbers up in the same way. And that's why <laughs> we should be able to compare them. But I, ha I still have real concerns about the comparability. <clears throat> so I wonder, Part of the discussion here uh, with, again, this sort of comparable data and you know, consistent definitions and the, the names and descriptions of things is that, well, the vagueness is a problem and some of the people, some, not all, people in markets have said, well, this is a problem and we really want the commission to solve this. Um, but I wonder if the commission, and so we've already said why there's problems with, yeah. with that approach, but maybe the commission doesn't 
actually need to solve it. And I, and I think there's an analogy here with what the Federal Trade Commission does with advertising claims. Um, so you can't have a, an actively fraudulent advertising claim, right? I think it was uh, Skechers Shape Up Shoes a few years ago claimed that they, they, they toned your gluteal muscles by 34.7% more than standard sneakers. And it turns out they were completely making that number up. Um, so they had to pay a fine to the FTC for misleading advertising. But you can say, if you have a sausage company, you can say, Morrison Sausages, the world's tastiest sausages. Go out and buy them today. Now, you might disagree that my sausages are, in fact, the tastiest, or you might think they're terrible, um, but you can't objectively disprove my claim. It's inherently subjective and what the FTC calls sort of puffery. Mm -hmm. right? And so for things that are, by definition, not quantifiable, the FTC simply says, well, claims and counterclaims go wild. right? You can say your uh, hot dogs are the tastiest in the world. I can say mine are the tastiest in the universe. And it's up to the consumer to compare those things based on their own taste. Um, for, you know, I think some people would say, well, these, these big financial investing decisions are too important, right? They're not like hot dogs, right? But if they're things that are fundamentally non-falsifiable, then I don't, I don't see how you can attach legal peril, like government regulation, to something that is not ultimately adjudicable in any quantitative sense. No, I think it's a good point that you're making, and I think I, I do worry. You know, one thing that we have in the U.S. that Europe doesn't have as much is we have litigation, right? And so you get not only SEC enforcement actions potentially, but you also get private shareholder class actions. Uh, and so we do have to think about what the standards we're applying are, and and. One of the things that we sometimes, I think, will be drawn into doing is taking these broad claims that are made around climate or around sustainability uh, or around you know, the way you treat your workers, and then something there, there's something bad that happens, and we say, aha, you lied. But the response might be, well, I mean, that was kind of, everyone knew that was kind of puffery. I think. Um, it can be difficult to know where the line is because some of these companies are out there saying, we are going to be net zero by 2050. Um, well, if you make a claim like that, I mean, shouldn't people be able to hold you accountable for making that claim? Should you really just be able to go out and make these broad statements? So it can be difficult to know the, the line between puffery and, and not puffery, but I think your point is, is a valid one. And going back to the question of the climate disclosure rule, for example, where uh, some advocates of the approach have said, well, there's some confusion now, and maybe it's not the most rigorous approach, but if we have these much more detailed granular reports from public companies, then we can compare and contrast them and sort them into uh, you know, 5,000 row spreadsheets, and um, people can adjust their climate exposure tolerance you know, uh, more specifically. Um, the, the premise, of course, all of this is that there is a reservoir of unmet demand among investors for much more detailed uh, climate information. But, and, uh, and I made this point at, at a conference in Miami with Professor Mario Loyola over there at Florida International University, um, that uh, a conference he was in charge of. If, you know, I got a, a question about this. It said, well, isn't it a good thing that cons potential investors, potential investors have more information about this? And I said, well, maybe, but the demand for the multi-billion dollar a year uh, regulatory compliance burden that would create this incredibly detailed data set, I think is actually pretty shallow and small. And you can see that by market realities already. Right? If people were that sensitive to climate exposure, ExxonMobil would already be out of business. Right? If people are not already dramatically shifting capital away from companies we know are energy intensive, right, or fossil fuel intensive, greenhouse gas intensive, because they're oil companies, oil and gas companies, why would we think that there's a huge number of investors are going to shift their capital because one company is 37% carbon intensive and one company is 36.8% carbon intensive, which is like the degree of specificity that this, these data disclosures would presumably provide for all of us. So there are a, f a couple things. I mean, one, when we talk about investors, um, 
sometimes that term is used to mean asset managers, and sometimes these asset managers who are managing a lot of people's money, usually in the form of mutual funds, ETFs, pension plans, um, they may have signed on to commitments where they have said that they will make their portfolios uh, carbon neutral by a, a specific point or where they will uh, try to achieve certain things. And so I think to meet their external uh, commitments, they may be required to have some sort of detailed information like that. Now, there's a question about whether those external commitments are consistent with fiduciary duty, and I think that the, that's, those are real questions. Individual investors uh, making decisions, you know, some of them may find a particular statistic really valuable in making a decision. Uh, it's true, but I, I think a lot of those investors, you're, you're right, are not likely to be invested in um, in an oil company, for example. So they may they may want to get very granular, but there's a question about whether that's it's my job to get that kind of granular information that most investors would not find material. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a fair point. Uh, although I do like your idea about companies having to c disclose which, uh, uh, which locations are the most beautiful and picturesque so I can travel to visit <laughs> them. Um, that's, I, may, I may be submitting a public comment on that topic. And I, uh, I think another point is a lot of people will say, well, Hester, come on, what's the harm of just more information? Companies are often producing sustainability reports, which are pretty detailed anyway. But I think the point is when you put something in an SEC filing, you do open yourself up to liability. And that liability comes at the cost of other shareholders who then have to pay for you to prepare that information and to... Um, potentially defend against suits. And so we the balance really does matter. Yes, data, better data tools enable people to analyze a lot of information now, whereas before it would have been hard, but it still is costly to present information. Uh, yes, and so, I mean, some people have pointed out recently that, I think there's a Wall Street Journal op-ed about this recently, is that ever larger disclosure documents become more and more unwieldy. So if you have, uh, there's maybe some analogy here to the National Environmental Policy Act and its uh, documents and reports, which you know 40 years ago were 50 pages long and are now 3,000 pages long. The expense and friction that that creates is a negative, it is a, is a financial loss. And so if, you know, if you're like a stock analyst and you're like, well, I'm reviewing this you know, portfolio of companies um, and in each disclosure is 100 pages, maybe that's reasonable if you have an intern. But if, if in the future we add everything to the wagon and we're like, okay, I'm going to throw a climate disclosure and then the so ethnic breakdown of your you know, workforce, I'm going to put that up there. And then you know, what are the, the third level down supply chain implications of human rights in third world countries? Um, once those reports become 10 times as long, they become much more difficult to process. And the the truly material information ends up getting hidden in these sort of endless, endless addendums and appendices of other stuff that is the sort of nice to have stuff. Uh, like, you know, Commissioner Purse, what's wrong with like adding my hobby horse and his favorite topic and this other guy's favorite interest? It's like, well, there is an actual harm there because the important information gets lost like a needle in a haystack. And I think another really important point is that management and company resources are being devoted to preparing this information and to thinking about this information. And so you really do end up shifting management's focus away from financial metrics to ESG type metrics. So you can have, it, it can actually be wonderful for corporate management because if, if they have a bad year financially, they can say, but we did really well on our ESG goals. <laughs> Aren't you happy about that shareholders? And, um, you know, what I found interesting is I went, I talked to a company and they said, our employees want to work. They're so enthusiastic about this ESG stuff. So they really excited about working on producing these ESG statistics. They're not as excited about producing the accounting information. And so what I think we're going to end up seeing is a degradation of the accounting information, not only because employees would rather work on ESG stuff, but because the loose standards that we have for accuracy and reliability on ESG statistics are going to end up bleeding over into accounting numbers. 
And so you're going to have, I mean, one of the things that's really distinguished the U.S. capital markets is that people think that they can rely on financial statements that companies produce. And if, if we lose that, we've lost something hugely important and, and that really distinguishes this country's capital markets. Now, the, the White House has made it clear that they have an, an all-of-government approach, as they put it, to climate change and, and other issues like uh, diversity. But, and this is sort of getting to the, the title of our, our session here, does that approach I, really mess, mesh with the best traditions of our system of government? Um, because federal agencies are created by Congress and they're individually charged by statute with certain specific missions. They're given certain limited powers to accomplish specified missions. And is it, it seems to me, uh, I guess I, I won't pose it as a question, I'll just say what I think. Uh, it's conceptually opposed to the way the US government is structured in the first place that every federal agency now has to be a climate activist uh, or you know, diversity activist. And so, and I, I think that skepticism applies even more to you know, what, what we call independent agencies like the SEC that are supposed to be insulated from uh, direct control by the president. I mean, some of our, our Federalist Society colleagues would argue whether that's a good thing or not, but at the, the, the current uh, status quo it is. And, and so is there, as do you think, there is a tension between having this sort of all of government approach, every federal agency has to have a climate agenda or has to have add climate to their agenda. Uh, does that run into the history of how our government is just supposed to be structured in the first place? Well, I think it's the, the discussion has really been reframed. So with respect to the SEC, people have said, look, these climate risks are material. These risks around how you treat your, your workforce are material. And so we're not really asking for the agency to become an environmental regulator or a labor and employment regulator. We're just asking you to, to do what your job was. Now, what I respond to that is, you know, typically we say to companies, you need to disclose the risks and opportunities, you know, that are material from your perspective. If those are around climate or around workforce, that's fine. We're not going to dictate that to you. We have pretty broad rules that tend to work for all companies over time. And when you do start to try to get into these individualized uh, topic areas, we do start looking more like we're part of uh, another regulator or part of a broader regulatory push. But I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are really genuinely motivated by, by uh, fears that they have about risks that are not being disclosed. I think when, when push comes to shove, when companies are actually asked, are you sure climate isn't a risk if they haven't disclosed it, typically they come back and they say, no, really, we don't think it is. Um, but you know, I, I, I can't really speak to whether there's some broader coordination. I just think the whole debate has been reframed so that it becomes an issue, a very big issue in financial regulation, for example. Banking regulators are looking at it through, they're saying, well, you know, the entities we supervise, this could be a risk to them. Um, so I, you know, I can't speak to what's driving that. It, it, it just seems to be the, the, the theme of the day. So in terms of long, sort of big picture, long-term risks, you mentioned that if rules like this make financial information from U.S. companies less reliable than that, that's a threat because that's one of our, <laughs> one of our greatest strengths as an investment market is that uh, you can actually trust the disclosures that we make and that they're useful and accurate. Uh, certainly something that's coming in the, in the context of people talking about China where PRC companies do not clearly have the same level of transparency uh, as U.S. companies. But I wonder in the long term, you, you know, so you mentioned looking at your European colleagues and, and how they consider us to be sort of behind them as if with the obvious implication that we are moving in, we are and should be at least moving in that same direction. And a lot of uh, what ESG sort of is and does and is supposed to be seems like centralization where everyone follows the same system. Every company reports in the same way, but in the future, every country will have the same system of 
financial regulation and disclosure and an enhanced disclosure for ESG topics. But I wonder if that is actually valuable because as, as we said before, when we say, well, things should be consistent and that sort of generally sounds like a good idea, but we don't know where the next market meltdown is going to come from, where the next financial crisis is going to come from. So does it make sense that different both firms, industries, and even countries having different approaches to this might actually be resilient and sort of non-brittle. Um, so if we all do every, everything the exact same way and we have a crisis that exploits an inherent weakness there, well then don't we all go down? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a real concern. I think we are creating a financial stability risk. I think we're creating an economic stability risk because we are, if we all use the same standards, we're going to all be driving assets toward the same, the same uh, uses. Uh, we're going to be driving capital toward the same uses. And if those uses are actually not the best, the highest and best use of capital, we're, we're cutting off economic growth. Um, but we're also potentially doing something like what happened with all the very good intentions of trying to get boost home ownership in the United States before the financial crisis. And there was a, there was a, a government-wide approach actually to trying to do that. And there were changes in, in the capital rules for banks. There were lowering of down payment requirements. There were all kinds of things. And it resulted in um, assets shifting in response to those regulatory incentives. And I think we're gonna see assets shifting in response to regulatory incentives around ESG as well. And I think that has potential stability consequences. And I agree with you. If we at least were taking slightly different approaches, weren't trying to make everyone uniform, there's something else I didn't mention, which is the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is developing international sustainability standards, which it will then try to get every jurisdiction to adopt so everyone will be operating on the same standards if they're successful. So yeah, it means if we get it wrong, it's going to be wrong across the board, and we will be re less resilient. Um, I think there is value to heterogeneity, and so um, it's. It, I, I think we are definitely marching in an unfortunate direction. And the goal is to get as much of the sustainability, uh, as many of the sustainability metrics woven into the financial statements so that it's all integrated. And so um, it will be even more difficult to disentangle this. It will be even more consequential if something goes wrong. So global financial meltdown, you heard it here first. If, if our, I mean, if our I, advice I is not taken. I don't want to be melodramatic, but I think that I think that there is clearly an attempt to use sustainability standard setting to drive capital flows, which is otherwise known as central planning. And if you do central planning in one country, that's one thing. But if you try to do it globally, that's another thing. And that can really have severe consequences. So I, I don't want to sound melodramatic, but I do want to sound the alarm that I think we're walking down a path that's not a good one.